Secretary of State. Mr Speaker, before I make my statement today, I'm sure the whole House will want to join me in offering our condolences to my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, and my noble friend, the Baron Johnson of Marleybone, on the loss of their mother, who sadly passed away yesterday. Our thoughts are with them and their whole family at this most difficult of times. Mr Speaker, with permission, I'd like to make a statement on the pandemic and our autumn and winter plan to manage the risk of COVID-19. Over the past few months, we've been making progress down the road to recovery, carefully and cautiously moving closer to normal life. And as we do this, we've been working hard to strengthen our defences against this deadly virus. We've been continuing the rollout of our vaccination programme, with 81% of people over the age of 16 having had the protection of both doses. We've expanded our testing capacity yet further, opening a new mega lab in Leamington Spa. And we've continued supporting research into long COVID, taking our total investment to £50 million. Thanks to this determined effort, we've made some major steps forward. The link between cases, hospitalizations and deaths has weakened significantly since the start of the pandemic. And deaths from COVID-19 have been mercifully low compared to previous waves. But we must be vigilant, as autumn and winter are favourable conditions for COVID-19 and other seasonal viruses. Children have returned to school. More and more people are returning to work. The changing weather means that there will be more people perhaps spending time indoors. And there's likely to be a lot of non-COVID demand on the NHS, including flu and norovirus. Today, keeping our commitment to this House, I'd like to provide an update on our review of preparedness for autumn and winter. The plan shows how we'll give this nation the best possible chance of living with COVID without the need for stringent social and economic restrictions. There are five pillars to this plan, Mr Speaker. First, further strengthening our pharmaceutical defences like vaccines. The latest statistics from the ONS show that almost 99% of COVID-19 deaths in the first half of this year were people who had not received both doses of a COVID-19 vaccine. This shows the importance of our vaccination programme, and by extending this programme further, we can protect even more people. Almost 6 million people over the age of 16 remain unvaccinated in the UK. And the more people that are unvaccinated, the larger the holes in our collective defences. So we'll renew our efforts to maximise uptake amongst those that are eligible but have not yet, for whatever reason, taken up the offer. Next, we've been planning our booster doses too. Like with many other vaccines, there's evidence that the protection offered by COVID-19 vaccine reduces over time, particularly older people who are at greater risk. And so booster doses are an important way of keeping the virus under control for the long term. This morning, we published the JCVI's advice on a booster program. They recommended that people who were vaccinated in phase one, that is priority groups one to nine, should be offered a booster vaccine. That this vaccine should be offered no earlier than six months after the completion of the primary vaccine course, and that as far as possible, the booster programme should be deployed in the same order as phase one. I can confirm that I have accepted the JCVI's advice and that the NHS is preparing to offer booster doses from next week. The NHS will contact people at the right time and nobody needs to come forward at this point. This, this booster programme, it will protect the most vulnerable through the winter months and strengthen our wall of defence even further. As well as this, we'll be extending the offer of a COVID-19 vaccine to even more people, as the Minister for COVID-19 Vaccine Deployment announced yesterday in the House. And thank you, Mr Speaker, for allowing him to make that statement yesterday. All young people aged 16 to 17 in England have already been offered a dose of a COVID-19 vaccine to give them the protection as they return to school. And yesterday, 
the UK's chief medical officers unanimously recommended making a universal offer of a first dose of a vaccine to people aged between the ages of 12 and 15. The government has accepted this recommendation too and will move with urgency to put this into action. We're also seeing great advances in the use of antivirals and therapeutics. Several COVID-19 treatments are already available through the NHS and our antivirals task force is leading the search for breakthroughs in antivirals which have so much more potential to offer. Second, Mr Speaker, testing, tracing and self-isolation have been another vital defence. Over the autumn and winter, PCR testing for those with COVID-19 symptoms and contacts of confirmed cases will continue to be available free of charge. Regular asymptomatic testing, which identifies currently around a quarter of all reported cases, will also continue in the coming months, with a focus on those who are not fully vaccinated, perhaps those in education or in other higher risk settings. And contact tracing will continue through the NHS test and trace system. We don't want people to face hardship for as they carry out their duty to self-isolate. So for those that are still required to self-isolate, we'll keep offering practical and financial support to people who are eligible and need assistance, and we'll review these regulations and this support by the end of March 2022. Our third pillar, Mr Speaker, is that we're supporting the NHS and social care. Last week, I announced a £5.4 billion injection for the NHS to support the COVID-19 response over the next six months, including £1 billion extra to tackle the elective backlog caused by COVID-19. We've also launched a consultation on protecting vulnerable patients by making COVID-19 and flu vaccinations a condition of deployment for frontline healthcare staff and wider, so wider social care workers in England. We're already making this a condition of deployment for people in CQC registered adult care homes. And although we are keeping an open mind and we won't be making a final decision until we fully consider the results of the consultation, I believe that it is highly likely that frontline NHS staff and those working in wider social care settings will also have to be vaccinated to protect those that are around them and that this will be an important step in protecting those at greatest risk. Fourth, Mr Speaker, we'll, be, we'll keep encouraging people to take steps to keep seasonal illnesses at bay, including flu and COVID-19. The best step that we can all take is to get vaccinations for COVID-19 and flu if we're eligible. And so, along with our COVID-19 vaccination programme, the next few months we'll see the largest ever flu vaccination campaign this country has ever seen. Our plan also sets out a number of changes we can all make to our daily routines, like meeting outdoors where possible, or if you need to be indoors, trying to let in fresh air, wearing a face mask in crowded and enclosed spaces, where you can come into contact with people that you don't normally meet. And, and Mr Speaker, our fifth pillar is how we'll look beyond our shores and pursue an international approach. Last week, I attended a G20 health ministers meeting and I met counterparts from across the world. And I talked about the part that we'll be playing to lead the global effort to accelerate access to vaccines, to therapeutics and to diagnostics. And as we do this, we'll maintain our strong defences at the border, allowing us to identify and to respond to variants of concern. It's these defences and the progress of vaccination campaigns both here and abroad that have allowed us to manage the risks and to start carefully reopening international travel once again. We've already relaxed the rules for fully vaccinated travellers, and I asked the CMA to review the issue of exploitative behaviour in the private testing market. This review reported last week, and I'm looking into what further action we can take. And I can also update honourable members that on top of these measures, we'll be publishing a new framework for international travel, and my right honourable friend, the Transport Secretary, will be announcing more details ahead of the formal review point on the 1st of October. Thanks to the defensive we've built, we've been able to remove many of the regulations that have governed our daily lives, rules that were unprecedented yet necessary. 
and our plan shows how we will be removing more of these powers while maintaining those that are essential for our response. This includes expiring more of the powers in the Coronavirus Act. So, for example, the, those powers directing to temporary closure of educational institutions. The remaining provisions will be those that are critical to the government's response to the pandemic. For example, making sure that the NHS is properly resourced and supporting statutory sick pay for those who are self-isolating. Mr. Speaker, the plan before the House today is our Plan A, a comprehensive plan to steer this country through the autumn and winter. But we've seen how quickly this virus can adapt and change. So we have prepared a Plan B of a contingency measures that we can call upon only if they are needed and supported by the data to prevent unsustainable pressure on the NHS. These measures would be communicating clearly and urgently to the public the need for caution, legally mandating face coverings in certain yeah. settings, and whilst we're not going ahead with mandatory vaccine-owning COVID status certification now, we'll be holding that power in reserve. As well as these three steps, we'd, we'd consider a further measure of asking people to work from home if they can for a limited time if that is supported by the data. Any responsible government must prepare for all eventualities. And although these measures are not an outcome that anyone wants, it's one that we need to be ready for, just in case. Mr Speaker, ever since we published our roadmap to recovery seven months ago, we've been carefully but cautiously getting this nation closer to normal life. Now we've come so far, we've achieved so much, we must stay vigilant as we approach this critical chapter so that we can protect the progress that we have all made together. I commend